we go. Hey, everybody. Happy Tuesday. Uh, you know what? My, there we go. Boy, um, I thought I had this sitting level tonight, but maybe my pictures are crooked. <laughs> Whenever I see a slit like that, it always makes me think of the old Batman uh, show, you know, how the, the bad guys, the Joker, the Riddler, the Penguin, their uh, hideouts were always slanted. Um, I swear I'm not a bad guy. Um, but I don't know how to make that. And then that makes it worse. Uh, well, well, that's a little better. Anyway, um, nice to see y'all again. It's been a couple of weeks. Um, the, um, uh, last time we got together, we had uh, Allison with us. She was visiting from uh, from Colorado, and uh, we talked a little bit about um, the difference between national parks and national forests, um, and the uh, touch just briefly on the uh, the movement that's going on downstate. For there's a, a group of people down there who would like to um, switch the Shawnee National Forest to a national park and national park and climate preserve, uh, keeping the trees there to help uh, offset uh, the carbon uh, uh, carbon dioxide that's in the air. Um, I heard a little bit from Allison since then she, she had a safe trip back. It was kind of, uh, snow was coming in. So she she hit the road in her trusty Subaru and is back out in Colorado again. But um, she did say that it's something that will likely take quite a while. Uh, it's not something that's going to happen overnight. It sounds like it's a simple, you know, we'll just slide um, this piece of land from one government agency to another. But any of you who've worked with government know that those slides can take um, years, uh, sometimes decades. Uh, so she she uh, did shoot me a little bit on that. And then I actually was texting with her this past weekend. Um, I was watching, uh, I have Hulu, and not, not Hulu TV, but just Hulu, you know, to, to watch uh, reruns um uh, stream different shows and hulu is always suggesting things that it thinks i should watch well there's a series that uh looks at um murders in national forests and so i texted allison i go so um you know is is this really a thing and she goes ah, yeah it kind of is uh they're very they're much more remote um a lot of times more rugged more wild um, and she actually had a, uh, a close call when she was doing a spotted owl survey. Not, she, she was not in any danger, but they did find, uh, some people who, uh, who were no longer alive. Um, so yeah, there's that aspect to, um, our national, uh, lands as well. Um, if, if you, if any of you have Hulu, the series is, it's a uh, murder on blood mountain or something like that, which is down in Georgia, um. That's the actual name of the mountain. It's not called that because um, of what happened there. Uh, but anyway, Meredith, I know you had um, found an article too about a movement to make a change uh, out east um, and how a, a park was uh, um, being regulated. And it, it is something, um, maybe we're going to start seeing more of it um, or... Maybe these are just a couple of isolated things um, happening. It would be kind of cool to have a national park in Illinois, but a national. Uh, Els Elson actually also mentioned um, a uh, designating part of the Shawnee as a wilderness area uh, that would help preserve it from uh, a lot of the uh, other things that come with national parks, um, you know, buildings. Uh, places to stay, restaurants, keeping it wild, I think is going to be uh, what a lot of um, what the locals down there are going to be advocating for. Um, so yeah, that was the update there. Um, oh yeah. Uh, this is what's been going on in the Good Natured Kitchen this evening. I think I'll actually give you the recipe for it at the end. Um, boy, it looks healthy, doesn't it? <laughs> um, 
the the, uh, the 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 recipe such as it was did call for this to be uh, strained a couple different times. Um, I I didn't have any cheesecloth and I tried a coffee filter, but my goodness, um, this would probably take days to strain through. So uh, I'm just gonna be sipping on it while we talk and um, I'll uh, incent him to, to stay awake till the end and I'll talk about what it is and how we made it. As it is actually um, pretty tasty and with no added sugar. Um, all right, you know, we've got um, some things that pertain to some of our slides too. Oh boy, the furry roommates, they didn't need them, but they moved them out of the way. Um, we we're going to be talking, um, actually, I just uh, turned in, it'll be running this week um, as a column part two of a look at these structures here. These are goldenrod galls, uh, and they are constructed by the goldenrod gall fly. That's what um, the column that ran last Thursday focused on was gall flies. Um, I have these here, but we're also going to look at them when we get to the slideshow part of the program. But boy, um, back when I worked at Red Oak, um, I this book was on the... Uh, to be pitched or donated pile. And so I grabbed it and it, um, it actually has, it's from the eighties. You know, a lot of things have changed since the 1980s. Um, some of the, uh, the things like, you know, um, the parts of binoculars have not changed, but um, the uh, availability of, of binoculars, the prices of binoculars, uh, lots of those things have changed, but it, Really, it gives you a step-by-step -step, um, guide to becoming a naturalist, how to dress, <laughs> um, things that are handy to have. Um, I don't even know if, if some of the companies they mention in here are even uh, around anymore. But the uh, reason I bring it up is I remember reading this at the time. There's a whole chapter uh, it's it's called North American Gold, and it's all about the goldenrod. And they do a really deep dive into the goldenrod uh, gall fly. So there's a, an illustration of it. It's not very big. Uh, fly. It's um, I would say it's it's bigger than a fruit fly. It is actually a type of fruit fly, but it's not. Uh, the Drosophiles, like we see, you know, that are on our bananas and stuff, those um, uh, are a, a whole different family of fruit fly. Um, but these galls are formed when the uh, the female gall fly lays an egg at the uh, the terminal bud of the uh, of a goldenrod turns out there's a couple different species they prefer the tall goldenrod and the giant goldenrod um i always thought it was canada goldenrod but you know goldenrod taxonomy is so there's a, a lot of um different divisions that are you know the lumpers and the splitters keep lumping and splitting the different species of goldenrod um when this book was written all the big ones were just lumped into Canada goldenrod, Solidago canadensis. And now there's um, different ways of looking at those plants. Um, I found that out when I actually, when I went to uh, uh, cut some of these galls, um, sometimes you'll look at a field of goldenrod and you won't see any galls. And you'll, for the longest time, I thought that was because there were no goldenrod golf flies there, but I think it was just, it wasn't the right species. Uh, these two uh, came from uh, Timber Trails Park. And we do see a lot of golf there, which was really nice back when we used to teach uh, a second grade uh, uh, field trip program there. It was called Bug Biographies. And it was always nice to be able to have these to talk about, but the ecology uh, the, the connections that go on in these galls is just really, uh, really fascinating. This book first enlightened me to it. And then 
um, you know, this was written before the internet. You can go, you can spend days, you talk about a rabbit hole, you can spend days and days uh, reading about the, uh, the creatures and the connections, because it's not just the goldenrod golf fly that inhabits it. Um, they come with a host of parasitoid wasps, um, and parasitoids, uh, those are parasites that kill their hosts. Uh, there's a couple different ones that specialize in goldenrod golf flies. I, I learned a new word, um, the inkline of the goldenrod golf fly, or a inkline, and that's a that's a word. Um, it's I n q u i l i n e s. Um, it means an animal that lives in the home of another animal. So. Um, you know, inside this gall and the, the gall as it ages, uh, so that the, the female fly lays her egg on the terminal bud of the um, plant. So this is all in uh, late spring and early summer. And then the, uh, the, the tiny little larva makes its way down into the stem here. And then uh, in response to excretions or secretions or chemicals that that larva gives off, the plant produces this extra tissue, which acts as a, um, a, a house uh, that the, uh, the fly larva will live in. It mostly fe feeds on plant juices, but these inkolines, so they're not, not the wasps, um, these inkolines are little roommates that can move in, they're beetles. Um, that can can um, the uh, beetle grub will live side by side with the fly larva inside these galls, and sometimes it's just a, your your basic roommate situation. They're sharing the space, um, and everything goes along okay. The uh, beetle grub feeds on the uh, the tissue that makes up the gall. The gall fly larva feeds on fluids within the stem. Well, it, that sometimes, and that's, sometimes that's all it is. And they, they both pupate and they go on their merry ways. But sometimes the uh, beetle grub will run out of gall tissue to eat. So then it eats the fly larva. Um, there, there, there's, there's just a you know, connection after connection that can happen inside these things. We'll take a look at this and another uh, type of uh, goldenrod gall when we get to the slides. I just wanted to show you that while I had it here handy and before somebody did, tries to take it away. And then I've got um, these two. We've got some slides of this, but I think we've talked about these in the past. These are... Um, I learned them as hedge apples, but the uh, uh, another common name for them would be the Osage orange. Um, the reason they're called hedge apples is this is a tree that um, it was introduced widely in agricultural areas. Uh, the tree can be uh, trimmed and trained to uh, grow together like a hedge. It's a very effective way of keeping either keeping things out or keeping things in, depending on why you need the hedge in the first place. Um, and the branches of the Osage orange tree have uh, little thorns on them. So it's it can grow very thick and uh, can be uh, pretty impenetrable. Well, this is the fruit that the female trees grow. And I always like to pick a few of these up when I see them. Um, they've got a very pleasant uh, uh, aroma to them. Supposedly, these can act as a repellent, and I've read everything from uh, spiders uh, to mice. Um, I guess you know whatever somebody's trying to keep away, uh, they will think a bowl of these might help do the trick. I don't know. I don't know why anybody'd want to repel spiders, but um, they uh, this I picked these up maybe two weeks ago. Um, and I was surprised that they really hadn't uh, gotten, so I guess we just haven't had cold enough weather. Once we get uh, a hard enough and long enough freeze, these do get pretty uh, squishy. Um, and 
they're they're not so pleasant to have around after that happens. But I do have a big bowl of them there in the kitchen because uh, it's kind of like a little natural air freshener. So we'll talk a little bit more about these two when we get to the slides. So let's um let's see, guys. Always you know take a week off and I tell you it's like starting all over again. All right, so I want to share the screen. So let's go here. And let's see if I can remember, there we go. All right, let's go back to the beginning of our slides here. Um, another little update, and Bob, a big thank you to you. Uh, this goes back a, uh, a few weeks. I remember when I had the, the really big feather? And then I believe the week after that, we talked about another really big feather. And Kay, that was thanks to you. You had given us the uh, wing feather from uh, Sandhill Crane which um, I don't have here, it's at the office. I didn't know, you know, furry roommates probably would have tried to eat it. So it is safe uh, on the shelf at my office. But um, the, the the really big feather that uh, our uh, neighbors here had found, um, it went down to the Field Museum. Um, and Look at this, I did compare it and I feel certain now that it is an eagle. So um, this will be a, a learning adventure for all of us because regular ordinary folks aren't allowed to keep eagle feathers. So I'm gonna call, we have a, a if you call it a rep, but uh, the, the there's a, a person that I communicate with each year as they turn in our uh, migratory bird, um, the, the permits that we have for the park district that allows us to keep things like feathers and nests, uh, parts of birds that we find, and the salvage permit, I guess you could call it, from the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, I need to get in touch with them to find out how we go about turning this feather in. Um, so that's that's kind of cool. Uh, but yeah, so it looks like we've got some confirmation that the really big feather uh, really was that of our nation symbol. Very cool. So again, Bob, thank you for um, following up on that and letting us know. Now we're going to go from really big feathers to um, kind of small-ish size moth. I got this uh, this picture sent in uh, via email. A couple of weeks ago, a woman had taken the, this photo last summer and just now got around to sending it in, wondered what it was. Well, I looked at this and I thought, oh, I know what that is. That is uh, one of the um, the moths that we see around hickory knolls every summer. It's a type of, of, of I think it's a beautiful wood nymph moth. Their key to survival is they look like bird poop. And then I pulled up the picture of the wood nymph that we'd taken a couple of summers ago. It was on the window at the Nature Center. I'm like, uh-oh, those are totally different. Um, this is pretty, pretty straight on, looks like bird poop. This one is much fluffier. Um, in fact, it looks like it's got a little squirrel tail on the bottom of it, doesn't it? Well, I, I was looking, I was convinced that these uh, similar moths, and look at the tufts of uh, little fuzz on the legs. Not being a lepidopterist, I thought these things have to be related. And I looked uh, throughout the, the family and I kept going up. If you go on Bug Guide, you can go, um, let's see, here's the wood nymph. Um, you can follow the taxonomy um, going from, like, here's the uh, the genus. You can go up to the subfamily and then the family and then the superfamily. You can keep going up to broader and broader categories. And I just uh, wasn't finding anything because... This is a completely unrelated, <laughs> other than the fact that it's also a moth, it's um, in a completely different superfamily. It's actually um, in the same family as tent caterpillars, which I was really surprised 
to learn. And now I don't know if this is the the large, there's also a small, and I don't know if that's Tolipi. I'm not exactly, uh, Tolipe, I'm not exactly sure how you pronounce that uh, genus. Um, the large and the small are quite similar. Supposedly, um, the small, as it says here, is a darker gray, um, and the large is a paler gray, but um, uh, the post median line on the forewing is more wavy. I don't. That's that's getting a little bit out of what I know about moths, but um, I'm pretty sure that's what this um, reader had found. Uh, they have um, a pretty broad. If we go back. Say so if we assume it is, if we go with the large, they, um, let's go here. Their diet, uh, the caterpillar, um, they, they, they feed on a lot of it. So it would make sense that this might be a fairly common moth that we could see around here. Um, a variety of broadleaf trees and shrubs, apple, ash, aspen, basswood, beech, birch, cherry, oak, and other woody plants. <laughs> so, um, not a fussy eater, sounds like. And but I, I um, still think with this um, prominent dark, there's still just a little bit of uh, bird poop camouflage going on here, like what we see with our beautiful wood nymphs. Anyway, that was kind of a, a fun little exercise that took a really long time because I just don't, I'm not good at, at keying moths out. It was more just looking, comparing um, similar pictures. Um, now let's see, where's our slide? Chip. All right, so there's our beautiful wood nymph. Now this, this is something, and I don't think we've talked about these um, recently. This is um, actually looking at the bottom of the, uh, oh gosh, is it the St. Charles Bell or the Fox River Queen? It's one of the paddle wheel river boats at Pottawatomie Park in St. Charles. And it's the one that didn't run much this summer. Uh, those boats, uh, the, the park district has been investing uh, quite a bit of, of uh, our mechanics time and uh, quite a bit of money in terms of, of upgrading, uh, modernizing those boats. Um, so one boat was in the water, but it didn't really run very much this year uh, as it was undergoing those upgrades. And look at what started to live on them. Does anybody recognize what all these are? Uh, here's another view um, farther off, just to give you this. Now they're, they're not completely covering the bottom of the boat, but yeah, these are zebra mussels. Uh, so not, not such a great thing to see. Um, We've had zebra mussels in this area for a long time, but um, the thinking, say, 15 years ago was, uh, you know, they can can make small little inroads in the river, but the river is is fairly shallow and it gets cold enough in the winter. These um, are pretty sensitive to to uh, deep cold, and once they freeze, um, they don't survive. But I think this this lack of of you know prolonged periods of cold that we've had these last few years here, I think the the zebra mussels are starting to um, increase in their numbers. Now, in talking with the uh, supervisor uh, at the park district who oversees the uh, the booking of the riverboat, she doesn't drive the riverboats, but she she plans all the programs and and the rentals and things like that. She said, you know, they've been having trouble with the there's a an intake pipe on each boat that I, I don't know if the water is is used to cool the engine the or just what the purpose of it is. But she said, you know, they're they're always clogged. They don't draw the water the way they used to. So I'm I want to stay on top of this this winter is um or as they get into spring and they start getting the boats ready to go back in the water because I want to find out if there's any chance um that those pipes might be clogged with baby baby zebra mussels. 
Um, that's the, the big problem with these guys. I know Fermilab, uh, boy, it's been a while since I've talked to anybody. And I know they were, they were struggling uh, with their intake tubes. A lot of the, the water, the surface water you see at Fermilab is, is used in uh, cooling capacities to keep all the equipment they have there you know, they, they use water to uh, to cool it with, and those intake pipes there were getting coated with um, zebra mussels. They they put out these things called bissel threads. That's how they attach, uh, and they can they can smother. I've even seen like out in the Mississippi River, they um, can smother native mussels. They'll just coat the, the bottom of the river and they'll attach themselves and the, the mussels then those bissel threads prevent the, the freshwater mussel from opening. And they, they end up, um, you know, I don't know if that's starving or suffocating, but they, they can't survive when there's a heavy infestation of zebra mussels. Um, the other thing I'm wondering is this was, you know, this is right in the impoundment above the St. Charles Dam. Uh, and I wonder if, because they do seem to to really do well in, in stiller, uh, you know, less flowing um, types of aquatic habitats. Um, but anyway, this was, I was a little surprised to see um, just how, how many zebra mussels had found their way onto the bottom of the uh, the paddle wheel riverboat there. Uh, anyway, what do we have here? So a um, little, little bit of burning had been going on. This is, this is I think this is one of the prettiest views uh, in St. Charles. Maybe I'm a little prejudiced because it is at Hickory Knolls. Um, and I, I do love, especially this is, the far west end of the Hickory Knolls natural area. There's two hills back there, the uh, the hill prairies, and the hill prairies are a somewhat unique uh, environment. They tend to have different types of plants. These are hills that were created by glacial deposits when those last glaciers from the Wisconsin period moved out. Um, they left these deposits here. And this one, um, as we look here, so this is where uh, yeah, some of the, the, the uh, grasses and plants were burned. Look at uh, what this hill is made out of. It looks like it just is one big pile of, whoops, <laughs> not Osage oranges, one big pile of sand. Let's zoom in here. Uh, these, um, I believe these are signs of ant activity. I, a lot of times, you, you know, it's it can be hard to tell if it's ants or bees, but in this particular area, I think we were looking at ant activity, but it is pure sand. And that, that sand that, uh, that's, um, has led to the the growth of some uh, some uh, rare plants, some state threatened plants, and also some endangered plants um, that are adapted to growing in that sandy environment. Pretty cool, huh? And um, so uh, Ryan Solomon, one of our ecological uh, restoration. He's actually our, our head uh, restoration ecologist. He um, is pretty handy with the chainsaw. So he has carved, if you stand here uh, where I took this picture from, there is a, uh, a tree stump that he has carved into a chair. So you can sit and enjoy this view. Uh, it's pretty all year round. It's, it's looking kind of south, southwest. Uh, you can see the set, uh, setting sun in this particular instance, but um, as, as busy and as, as hectic as, as things can be around the Tri-Cities, this, uh, even though it is still uh, within, well, actually it's just outside of the, the city boundaries, <laughs> um, it just really gives you a, a taste of uh, and a, a reminder of the calm and peacefulness that can prevail when you're out in nature.
with the ants. So yeah, so here I um uh, this particular group of Osage orange trees is growing along the uh, the side of a, a field that's still in agricultural production. It's part of the um, the Prairie Green Cooperative, which I I don't really know what happened there. That was an effort that came together. I don't know. 10 years ago or more, it was the city of Geneva, the Geneva Park District, and I think the Forest Preserve District had gone together to acquire land along um, local folks. It would be uh, Peck Road between 38 and Kesslinger on the west side of Peck. Um, and they were uh, they were breaking tiles. They were going to drain tiles. They were going to turn it into a sedge meadow. But it, I don't know. It, it's got It's got a trail. It's not a loop trail though, which is sort of a, um, I guess mostly a bike trail. People, you can walk on it, but you have to go out and back. There's not really a good way to make a loop. I guess you could make your own loop, but um, uh, the trees that divide that are along the side of the um, the farm field. Um, there's farm fields uh, to the uh, south and there's community garden plots uh, run by the Geneva Park District north of there. And I see these, these um, Osage oranges when I drive by there on Peck Road. You can see here a lot of the leaves too have come down. Um, this is a fruit that I believe we've talked about these before. It's uh, what's called an ecological uh, anachronism, which means it's kind of a throwback or a holdover, or um, it's a plant that in this area has lost its connection, uh, its natural um, dispersal agent. There, there's not really an animal. Oh, my friends that have horses say their horses love to eat these, so maybe we could say that they help disperse the seeds. But um, other creatures around here that that try to eat them, like say our squirrels, they'll they'll chew into the side of it. In fact, here we can, if we zoom in here, we can see what the seeds look like. There's a couple hundred of these seeds that are shaped kind of like a watermelon seed. They're thinner though. Uh, and it's, it's a lot of work to get to that seed. Um, this green, uh, fleshy part of the fruit is, um, it's kind of bitter, and I know this because I tasted it, <laughs> and it's sticky, and I know this because it was all over the knife I used to cut one of these open. It's it's a sticky white, um, kind of like what you'd see in, um, you know, a, a dandelion stem or milkweed. Um, it's a like a latexy sort of uh, uh, liquid that maybe is there to prevent the seeds from being eaten. Um, there's a, a pretty strong case though that the uh, the original uh, range of this uh, tree was created and maintained by our uh, charismatic and now dead <laughs> megafauna are mastodons that uh, in the some of the other big ice age megafauna would feed on these large fruits. Um, their big teeth and their big mouths would allow them to take the whole fruit in. Um, they would chew it a little bit and swallow it, but they they didn't um, chomp it up enough to destroy these seeds. So the seeds would pass through the digestive tract and uh, come out and we'd get new Osage orange trees. The animals that eat this fruit today, uh, when they chew it up, uh, these seeds get destroyed or they don't even, you know, they, 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 they eat the seeds, <laughs> which will, you know, make them so that they cannot be, um, expelled <laughs> and then uh, they will not be turning into new plants. So they, this is a, a plant that has lost its dispersal um, agent. The other, we actually have two other trees in this area that uh, same thing happened to. One is the honey locust and the other is the Kentucky coffee tree. So three 
ecological anachronisms uh, right here in Kane County. Um, so how did they get here? Uh, by humans. Humans brought them here. Um, this is uh, the Osage orange tree, which I don't think I took a picture of the actual tree. Um, I think I just took a picture of the fruit. I should have um, showed you the what the uh, um, the wood looks like or the, the bark looks like. It's a tree that uh, is valued for its wood. Uh, back in the day, when uh, before we had barbed wire, people would would plant these um, to uh, form their fence lines. The um, Native Americans that the tree is named after the Osage tribe. They were well known for making fine um, bows, you know, for hunting, and they used the wood of the Osage orange tree to do that. You could trade a branch of an Osage orange for a horse. That's how valuable the wood was. So. Yeah, uh, it's a, a cool, I think it's a cool plant. Now, the other side of it is uh, from a natural areas management perspective, they're weedy, they're they're uh, tough to deal with because of those thorns. They they tear your, your clothes, they tear your gloves, they tear your skin, <laughs> um, and they are, are not considered native to this area. So I know most management plans call for their removal, but I still think they're cool. And um, also because they're not native, you can uh, pick up these uh, fruits freely and uh, take them away and enjoy them. Yeah, like I am. So on my way to um, pick up those, now wait, wait is this? This might be a young Osage orange tree. Look at those thorns there. You see those? Um, on my way to the uh, the tree line to pick up those fruits, this caught my eye. And this is actually the column I'm working on right now. I love when things in nature get reappropriated. This was um, a bird's nest, but you can see it's been... Uh, it's like it was a fixer upper. <laughs> this is all, I believe this is all milkweed fluff up here. We see this when uh, a mouse moves into a bird's nest. And I always think that's kind of a, you know, a sort of a risky maneuver when you figure there's, there, there's gotta be a lot of cover down on the ground, you know, like, you know, especially areas like this natural areas where, it's not raked. There's no leaf blowers going around. Like there would be layers and layers of leaves that I would think could be fashioned into a pretty neat nest. But I see this pretty often um, out here. It was nice. What what I the reason I, I was attracted to this and and I found it so refreshing. This is all natural materials. Sometimes uh, we'll see uh, birds' nests uh, in um, like the the parking lot at Hickory Knolls and the there'll be a mouse that has moved in there but instead of uh, taking natural materials it will have well there'll, there'll be some say milkweed fluff but then there will also be um, strips from a, a plastic bag or ribbon or you know all the the man-made all the, the the junk that people leave behind but i just thought this was was kind of cool and it's it's a fun little winter hobby to have when you it, this is the time of year where the, the leaves are are finally off of the trees you can see the nests from this past summer and it's kind of fun to see uh see if you can find some that have uh, been uh repurposed or recycled uh, the the column that I'm, I'm working on now is actually looking not only at at mice reusing the um, the, the bird's nest, but um, the many uses of milkweed fluff. We'll probably explore this more next week because I haven't really delved too deep into it yet. But uh, milkweed, uh, the 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 fluff, uh, the down from the milkweed seed has all kinds of uses. Um, historic uses back during World War II uh, in its use in stuffing uh, life jackets, life preservers. 
And there's even a movement today uh, to bring it back into uh, modern usage with um, clothing and also in, um, in pillows. So and we'll talk more about this again, but for now, take this as a, a challenge uh, that you, you might want to undertake. See if you can find a nest that a mouse has um, moved into and uh, taken as its own. But then of course, you know, <laughs> I still, I'm just fascinated by this. Um, Boy, now that I'm looking at it, I could have focused it a little bit better, but it's also the time of year now that the, the leaves are down. It's time to start looking for walnuts in crazy places. Um, you know, this is something squirrels do, and I have yet to figure out just why it is. You know, is it hedging their bets? Is it a temporary stash that they come back and get? Uh, I I know I've been find I found actually two here in the uh, the neighborhood this summer that I think were from last year that I think were just forgotten. So, but it is it is the time when we can start looking uh, for walnuts in crazy places. This also reminds me, I don't have a picture of it, but um, you know, I planted the, uh, the white walnut that I'd found, the butternut. I think Sarah, that was your suggestion and it did, germinate, it sprouted, it grew, it was probably a foot tall. Um, I put it in the ground because that was the best place for it to overwinter. Um, well, two things happened. I did not um, put a fence around it because I thought it being a, a Euglens, a, a, a walnut species that the rabbits wouldn't touch it because I've got a whole bunch of other walnut trees coming up around the backyard. Well, um, maybe white walnut, butternut is not as resistant. Maybe it doesn't taste bad. I don't know what it was, but the rabbits nipped it off. Um, I'm still hopeful that it, it you know, will survive that. Um, but the other thing, I, where I planted it at was kind of a low spot in my yard and I thought, you know, this, it was actually, the soil was kind of moist there. I thought this will be good because I'm not always great at, at remembering to water things. Well, <laughs> a little plumbing issue last week and I found out that um, the uh, the sewer pipe that leaves my house, the, the clay pipe is broken. So I have a feeling I planted <laughs> the butternut above that broken pipe, which is why the soil had kind of a dip and why the soil seemed kind of moist. So um, I am going to go out and dig up the sad remains of the butternut. And um, I don't know, maybe the ground is still pretty soft. I might just be able to stick it in the ground somewhere else, or I might throw it in a pot and just keep it in the, the garage over the winter. But here, I thought maybe there's going to be a chance we could get a, a butternut started in the yard, but it, uh, I don't know. We'll have to see how that saga ends. Um, not too thrilled about the broken pipe either, but anyway, that's another story. Um, here's so here's our um, our goldenrod uh, gall um, pictures again that we started off with uh, at the beginning of the program. Let me zoom in here. Um, you can see that there's two different shapes here. This is one of the uh, gall fly um, galls. And this is the elliptical gall moth gall. Um, so a completely different order of insects that makes use of the goldenrod stem. Um, and the, the larvae behave differently too. Uh, the goldenrod gall fly uh, overwinters as a larva inside of that gall. It uh, then pupates in the spring. Um, they have to, it's really cool. They have to dig a, an exit tunnel while there's still a larva because when they're an adult, when they're a fly, they don't have the means to do that when they're larvae. The fly larva actually has two hooks that it can use to excavate and make a tunnel 
it stops just shy of the um, uh, the outside. It, it, it leaves just a thin layer of tissue that it can easily then bust through when it uh, comes out as a fly. It actually has a um, uh, tilinum, tilinium. Uh, there's a little structure that pops out of its head like a, uh, yeah, like a um, an airbag. <laughs> And uh, they use that to, to push through, it protects the, the fly's head. And then that um, inflated organ, um, actually it, it doesn't it fill with air, it, it fills with fluid. Um, the the uh, insects, um, kind of like it's blood, the hemolymph, well, it um, deflates then goes back inside the head. You never see it again, but it, it can push its way out uh, breaking through that last little layer of tissue. The gall uh, moth, they actually do chew all the way through as a caterpillar, because again, moths don't have chewing moth parts, mouth parts either. So they chew all the way through and then they create um, a bung, B-U-N-G, which I love the word because um, I actually have a, a bung magnet uh, on my refrigerator, it, uh, bungs are used. Uh, another word would be, a, you know, a, a stopper, uh, but they are uh, wider on the outside and narrower on the inside. Uh, the uh, gall moth can push that bung out, um, like you know, pushing the bung out of a, uh, a barrel of wine or. In my case, the bung I have is from a uh, barrel of Maker's Mark bourbon that I got when I visited the distillery, but they, they push that bung out with their head. Um, this is the other side of that elliptical gall moth uh, gall, and you can see, so this, this creature has already exited. They do not stay in over the winter. So they uh, mature, they leave, um, and they overwinter in the egg stage. So this uh, pupated, came out as a moth, mated, and now there's there's eggs that are going to start the cycle over again next year. But that's the, the exit hole there where they poke the hole out. Uh, the, um, the way they chew uh, causes a, a ridge around the exit hole, whereas the... Um, the gall fly exit hole, it's, it's rounder and it's, it doesn't have this extra like ridge around it. So gall flies, gall moths, um, parasitoids, inquilines, all kinds of drama surrounding those gall uh, structures. Now, um, some of you might recognize the spark uh, this is kind of a close-up. I'm going to zoom out now. You might recognize it better from a little farther away. And if that doesn't ring any bells, maybe looking at the branches will. Um, in fact, if we zoom in here, not only are we looking at the fruit of this tree, but we can see some of the leftover leaves. This is a tree that um, is known not only for its fruit, but the weird little galls that grow on its leaves. They're called nipple galls. Uh, this is a hackberry. Here's a leaf here. Can we see any galls? Um, eh, galls aren't as prominent here, but yeah, look at all of this fruit. Um, Hackberry trees are really, really common around here. And I've got a ton of small ones coming up in the backyard. This is a, a fruit that a lot of birds feed on. Uh, and it turns out humans uh, can feed on hackberry berries too. Um, they're surprisingly sweet, but you, I tell you, you do not want to bite down hard on them. There, there, there's just a thin little layer of uh, flesh surrounding a, a pretty good sized um, pit or stone seed in the center. Um, the outside skin 
at this time of year, it has the, it reminds me of um, the candy coating on the outside of an M&M. &M. So, you know, it kind of cracks when you, when you chomp on it. And then there's just this little, little flavor, uh, little sweetness that comes through when you, um, uh, when you chew on the, the berry. This, um, particular tree actually there's there's three of these trees this is just down the block here from casa Otto at the uh, geneva high school there's a, a complex of athletic fields there's the uh, baseball fields and the football field down there uh, usually hackberry fruit uh, the, the trees have a, a growth habit where the the fruit that the trees grow pretty fast. The fruit is usually out of reach, but for whatever reason, these trees they have um, branches that droop down, so the fruit is really easy to harvest. And you might be able to now figure out where this is going. Um, I walk by here with my dogs a lot, so one day I took um, a, uh, a Ziploc bag with me. And I got about a cup of these berries because I heard that, you know, you could eat them. And then I started looking at what else you could do with them. Turns out you, you, uh, you get several handfuls and then, and they're, they're pretty easy to pick. You know, they're, they, they grow. Remember a month or so ago, we talked about this being a mast year and how it, there's, there's hard mast and there's soft mast. Uh, the, the the fruits and the nuts that these trees are producing uh, are in huge quantities this year. So it didn't take me long to uh, fill that little baggie. I brought it home and um, I found a recipe where you uh, take, you can either use a mortar and pestle, which is what I opted for, or you could, uh, you could also throw them in if you've got one of those like bullet drink blenders, you could put them in there. Uh, with uh, it's the ratio is a cup of berries to two cups of water. So I got this out the other day and I was, um, I think I was watching, oh, I, I was watching the, uh, the, the serial killers in the for, uh, national forests show. <laughs> I was watching that and pounding these uh, hackberries. And um, so uh, th this turns into um, it, it re the consistency reminded me of uh, sort of like a, a fruit leather type of consistency. It was it was kind of sticky. Uh, it was very sweet. You put that in uh, a pan with a couple of cups of water and you let it simmer for about 20 minutes. And this is what you end up with. Now, um, Susie, I think you're on tonight. You corrected me. The The recipe that I chose for this called this hackberry milk, but the uh, the FDA's definition of milk is liquid from a lactating mammal. And this is not um, that. <laughs> so uh, I suppose we could call it milk, M-Y-L-K. I did a little research into what people call, uh, you know, because like almond milk, you know, a lot of non-mammal-based liquids are using that term milk, and it's really not right. I thought elixir might be a good term because it, it really is tasty. There's a surprising amount of sugar in those little berries. Um, and the, the texture of this is pretty, you know, it's not, you know, there is that settling there. I'm not exactly sure what that's gonna be like. Uh, the, the grit is gone. You'd think because of the the hardness of the seeds that the there would be a lot of grit in here. Um, that mostly got strained out. Um, if you've ever had um, uh, apricot nectar, if you if you can imagine that um, uh, thickness or consistency, that's that's about what what this um, this feels like. It's got a pretty nice mouth feel. It. Um, Yeah, I didn't add any any sugar to it, and it is plenty sweet. So if you're lucky enough to have a, a hackberry nearby that has berries that you can actually reach, or um, you can also go down there, or 
plenty of berries left over here uh, in the trees in Geneva. Go ahead and, and get a, a cup of them and either uh, blend them or, or crush them. Uh, simmer them for about 20 minutes and uh, you too can have uh, a delicious hackberry beverage. Um, with that, uh, so thank you, Susie, for the milk lesson. Yeah, uh, yeah, you know, that's a term I didn't really, um, you know, cons I, I, you know, you see it in the stores all the time. But yeah, the dairy farmers are the ones that are producing actual milk, and these other beverages um, really should find their own terms for describing what they're selling. All right, let's see. We got a couple of chats here to get to. Are tree burls caused by chemical excretions of insects? You know what, Laura? I actually, um, it's funny you mention that. I have a burl. Um, let's see, uh, I can pull it up here. Um, I'll, I'll go back to sharing here in just a second. Um, I took a picture of a dual burl on a tree at uh, Elburn Woods Forest Preserve. And um, I got to, you know, trying to figure out, reading uh, about what causes burls. And it turns out there's a lot of things that can cause it and nobody's really sure. Okay, here, I'll... Um, Nobody's exactly sure um, what if, if it's a if it's a number of causes working together here. I'm going to share this real quick. Um, see, look at this one; it's on both sides. Um, am I screen sharing? Participants can now see you. Okay, so yeah, you can see that. So um, yeah, this thing was massive goes almost all the way around the tree and yeah I the, so the article said it it thought that there, there's some kind of trigger it might be uh, kind of like scar tissue that the tree is producing in response to um, an injury um, and a disease so it, the, the the thing the explanation I read was that there's not a lot of consensus on what causes them. Um, but, and then it went into a whole big thing about how popular they are with woodworkers. <laughs> um, so I don't know. Um, I, I kind of think it might be a separate mechanism than what we're seeing when we see them, when we, when, than what we see in galls. I think galls and burls might be two different things. But, um, well, let's took a picture of uh, Great Plains. Oh, lady tresses. Um, I will tell him, Wallace, because I think he would want to know that. Um, that's the sort of thing that they are looking to catalog. So um, I'll make sure that he gets word about that. I'm actually going to see him. We have a meeting tomorrow morning at 9, so I will let him know that. Thanks. Uh, thanks for uh, taking that. Um, uh, back in the 70s, my mom used to slice Osage oranges and bake them. Oh, yeah, I have heard about that, Sarah, that you can, because I, um, I always hate that, like, that they don't stay like this. They, they, they either shrink, they dry out and they shrink, or they, um, they get mushy and, and yucky. But yes, that is one of the ways you can preserve Osage orange um, and use them like you said, in dried flower arrangements. Um, the park district, occasionally someone will harvest some of these and put them in uh, Christmas arrangements. But again, they don't last as long. That's a great idea. Slice them. Um, and they do, I think they kind of curl a little bit in the oven. They don't stay flat, but they they get a, a pretty little curl to them and you can make them, uh, yeah, use them in arrangements. Another hint, another craft. <laughs> While you're brewing, your uh, hackberry elixir, <laughs> you can dry out some of your Osage orange slices. I like it. Um, 
Uh, hackberries at this time of year are really dark. Are they rotten or can you still use them? Yes, they, 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 they are very dark, um, but they are very, very sweet. Um, so yeah, this, I, um, I suppose they, they might get to a point, of, like if they're wrinkly, they might not be good anymore. They might have turned into hackberry prunes. Um, but these, the, the outside skin, again, it, it was dry. It like crackled like like the outside of an M&M. &M. Um, and then there's just the thinnest little bit of fruit. Um, and then the, the pit or the seed is, is most of what uh, is inside there, but you, you smash them up. Now, in reading about the the history of hackberry, uh, people's use of them, they say that that um, the nut or the, the the seed is quite nutritious, and um, like people would would just eat them. Now may, maybe there's it's a, you need to pick them sooner than now in order to be able to do that. These things, I thought they were like rocks. I would have broken a tooth for sure. Um, if I try to crunch on it, but smashing it up with the mortar and pestle, um, you know, wasn't that difficult to do. Um, and, uh, I don't, maybe I should save the pulp. Maybe, maybe that's good eating. I maybe I'll check on that and let you guys know next week. <laughs> um, let's see. Okay, so Chris uh, puts you, so you cut them in half and put them in your dehydrator. So another way to do it. And do birds enjoy hackberries? I think they do. I don't know how much, um, or I don't know how much um, nutrition they get out of them because I do find um, the the seeds in the bird bath. So they, they their body must take the, the sweet part off, but the seed itself passes through intact. Um, I also wonder like would a squirrel, I would imagine their teeth would be sharp enough to chew open those seeds um, and get, the, the, the article did say there was a lot of nutrition inside. Of course, I can't remember now what all the nutrients were, but um, yeah, they, I think they're you know pretty, pretty good uh, food if you can bust open that seed. The birds do eat them, but I, you know, I don't know how much nutrition they're getting from them. Uh, so thanks, Chris, for that tip about dehydrating. Thanks, Flora, for that question. And oh, Di, um, years ago, I went to holiday craft class. We stuck pieces of evergreen branches in the Osage orange. Oh, pretty, with red ribbon and made a kissing ball. Aw, I could see that. Um, oops. Yeah, it was a it was a very uh very attractive. And you put a long ribbon on it to hang it up, and it lasted through the Christmas season. I could and see it, it was really pretty, and you but you needed a lot of evergreen branches all the way around to to make it round it, you know, all to um, make it circular. But yeah. um, it was I, kind of pretty. I like that. Yeah. Um. Uh, well, and it is. I mean, the 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 fruit is is very solid. I would guess this weighs close to a pound. Um, it's pretty heavy, but um, it's easy. I can stick my fingernail into the flesh. It's. I, I think. It's, I think we used like a nail or something to make, to the, make hole the hole, and then stick the evergreen in it. Oh, and the nice good. thing is that the evergreens uh, stayed fresh because they were taking the moisture out of the Osage orange. Oh, oh. yeah. Might have to give that a try too. So there's all kinds of possibilities. <laughs> Well, I got I've got about a dozen or more than that in the bowl in the kitchen. So uh, maybe when I finish drinking, <laughs> I'll start drilling. <laughs> All right, folks, you know what? It's uh, I know we started a little bit late, but it is now um uh, 10 after nine, sticking some clothes. Laura, you are just all kind of got all kinds of good ideas tonight. Um I like that idea too. That would and I think I just found uh, some clothes that I didn't know I had. I, I rearranged uh, my uh, spice cabinet. I got a lazy Susan from my mom's house and I found I had some clothes. So I might give that a try too. Ah, 
I better get going. <laughs> Everybody, thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Uh, have a great rest of your week. And uh, we'll be back again next Tuesday. Thank you. Thanks so much. Good night. Thanks, guys. Have Thanks, a good Pam. Night. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Pam. Bye-bye. Night, Pam. <laughs>